Okay, so um, what, I th what I thought I'd do, I want to talk a little bit about critiquing your own pottery. And I purposely called the, pot, the, t the talk critiquing your own pottery because I figured if I just said, let's talk about critiquing, nobody would come. Because at least it's been my experience in the past that people talk about critiquing, but when it actually comes to doing it, especially on their own work, all of a sudden people become very sensitive and shy and self, self you, know, it, 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 they're, you know, they're not very self-confident. So I thought this way, the real purpose is things that you can do to, to look at your own pottery to make it better. So you don't have to worry about what somebody else thinks about it. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. So and I guess, and one way to talk, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, t I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of the classic principles of design. I don't wanna go into that too much, but I want to at least give you a little bit of background about classic design principles and what traditionally people have used to judge both two-dimensional and three-dimensional art. And then I'll go into the part that I'm going to re I really wanted to talk more about was how can you translate those into sort of usable suggestions? And I'm going to put the suggestions in the form of questions so that you'll, they'll, there'll be questions that you can ask yourself or you can, you can think to yourself about your own work, okay? And critique, so critiquing basically, just to, as an introduction, Critiquingly is really meant to be constructive criticism with the emphasis on constructive, okay? Um, the purpose of it is really to improve the quality of your own work. That's the whole point, really. And it involves recognizing, and this is, this is true whether you're looking at your own work or whether you are participating in a critique and you're critiquing somebody else's work. It involves recognizing your strengths and weaknesses. That's the whole point. So you look at a work, and if it's your own work, you can say, what could I do to, to improve the work? How could the work be improved? Um, and so basically, you would keep the good features and then try to improve or work on the weak ones. So a big part of this is then being able to look at a piece critically or analytically and say, well, what are the strong features? What are the features that are, that are positive? And what are the weaker features that I probably should work on? Okay? Um, so really, what you, one of the, another way to look at it is sort of educating your intuition. You, you don't have to, I like to, I don't, I don't rely a whole lot on the formal rules which we'll talk about, but a lot of it can be intuitive. And just you look at, you know, something's wrong. There's something about this piece that I don't like or it doesn't work completely. And you don't necessarily have to know exactly all the, the logic behind it, but you can look at it and say, there's something wrong. So then the process would be, I'm going to look at it and say, okay, try to look at it and say, okay, well, what's wrong with it? What is, can, now can I do some analysis and say, well, what, is it too big? Is it too small? Is it the wrong color? Is it the wrong shape? What is it about it that bothers me? So it's like following through on your initial intuition. And, and people's intuition is usually pretty good. You'll look at something and say, there's something wrong with that, but I don't know what. So then this involves going a little further and saying, okay, let's figure out, let's try to figure out what is wrong with it so that I can change it. That's the idea. So an important part of this also is not just looking at something, but seeing it. Re seeing what's really there, not just looking and saying, okay, yeah, I see it, but, but what, are you actually, what are you actually seeing when you look at it? Um, so as I mentioned, and, and this, is, this is actually, if you haven't done a lot of it before, it can be a difficult process to little, sort of look analytically at something and look beyond the idea of, oh, I like it or I don't like it, but is there something wrong? Is there something that bothers me about it? Or is there something, and we'll talk about some conventions, is there something that, sort of violate some of these generally accepted conventions about the way pieces should be designed. Um, so anyway, so, but I'm gonna, when, I, when we get to it, I'm gonna, the, the, the comments I wanna make or the suggestions are really in the form of questions that you can ask yourself or a way of looking at it and not so much the formal rules. But I did wanna talk a little bit about the formal rules just as an introduction in case you haven't heard about them before. So there are, and people call them, you know, they're rules of design or what, whatever, however you wanna title them. Um, but they're really, I, I guess I'd more prefer to think of them as conventions about design. And frankly, I personally don't take them too seriously because if you, if you look at the history of art, for, for each period in art, there will be certain conventions that people followed. And when somebody totally broke the conventions, they didn't go, oh, it's terrible art. They said, oh, how creative, how innovative, how imaginative. <laughs> so these are like artificial rules that were not semi-artificial, you know, rules that were put out there and then people purposely broke them, you know, so, which is, that's normal. So, to me, I can't take the rules too seriously if when you break them, you're considered creative and innovative. 
you know, they're not hard and fast rules, but there are certain conventions that over the centuries for two-dimensional art and three-dimensional art have become generally accepted to be sort of good rules without, get, you know, without getting too detailed about it. So design, basically, the term design, I'll give you a definition. It's the arrangement of parts or elements in a space to accomplish a purpose. That's the definition of design when we call it. And I, design, I don't mean like a pattern, like a wallpaper pattern. Design, I mean the arrangement or the planning or the, the, the overall arrangement. So the design of something is defined as the arrangement of elements or parts in a space to accomplish a purpose. And all of those parts of the definition are important because it, the point is that when you're, creating, when you're designing something, you're doing it for a reason. And the reason may simply be to create something beautiful. It, it doesn't have to have a, a practical function, but it has a purpose. You have a direction. You, it, it might be a functional piece, so it has a specific purpose. Or it might, again, it might, it might be to tell a story. It might be what's considered a narrative piece where you want this to, to have a message, and so the purpose is the message. But the point is, you're, you're creating this work of art, two-dimensional or three-dimensional, you're arranging the parts in a way to, to serve a purpose. So the, in terms of the terminology, the elements, when they call it elements of design, those are the parts. We'll talk about those in a minute. So you have elements, which are parts, and then you have the principles, which tells you how you arrange the parts. So I have, I have part, so I can look at anything and I can, like a chair, and I can say, well, there's a back, there's legs, there's seat, there's foot pads, and, and those, are the, those are the elements of the parts, and then they're arranged according to certain principles. And the principles might be function, they might be practical things, this thing has to work, or it might just be a beautiful arrangement, okay? And again, if you have any questions or anything, you know, as we go along, you know, say something. Okay, so let's talk just briefly. Again, this is just this introduction. This is the form, sort of the traditional formal way that people talk about design. Frankly, also, it's, it, it hasn't been, I don't think there's been as much emphasis in design um, as in, in two and three-dimensional art as there has been traditionally in two-dimensional. Because what was considered serious art for a long period of time was mainly two-dimensional. Paintings, drawings, tapestries, this sort of thing. So I think it's only been, you know, more recent times that we've started to accept ceramics as, as, a, as a, you know, a, a worthy form of art, and we've started to apply some of the same design principles or the design analysis to three-dimensional art that we have for a long time to two-dimensional art. So a lot of this is, is sort of terminology that has crossed over from looking at two-dimensional art, and now we're trying to apply it to three-dimensional. So, so these, there, there, are, there are basically, I've got five elements of design or the component parts that I'll talk about. These are just sort of different kinds of parts you can have. Well, one would be, the first one is the form, which would be the three-dimensional term, or the shape in the two-dimensional term, the shape of the parts. What is the form? What's the, what's the form? And you can have, what's the form of the, of the overall work of art? And what's the form of the individual pieces? That's, um, and, and, and the reason why this is important, I mean, first, part of it is just naming. What is it? Is it, is it a circle? Is it a sphere? In a sphere? Is it a cylinder? What is the form? What is the basic form? And the other thing is, that goes along with this is different shapes, because we're, we're, you know, we're, we're human, different shapes have different implications and different qualities when we look at them. So certain forms or shapes in two dimension can have, for instance, be active or passive. I can have a form that looks very passive and stationary and stable, or I can have a form, for instance, that looks very active. And so part of this goes along with what are you trying to convey with the work? What do you want the work to be saying? What do you want, what do you want the, the viewer that's looking at the work to see? Do they want to see, are you trying to present something that looks calm and stable and passive? Or are you trying to create something that, that suggests energy and movement and force? So the, 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 it, it's not just what the shape is, but, but what does the shape suggest? And there are different kinds of forms also, along with what I just said. I mean, there are sort of organic forms. So you had the whole, for instance, the Art Nouveau art movement, where all of the forms were basically related to nature and very organic in nature, okay? And you can have very geometric forms, a lot of, a lot of hard angles, hard lines, sharp lines. And again, there's a, there's a different psychological connotation to when you're looking at something that's very organically with tendrils and all the curves, the sinuous curves of, of Art Nouveau versus something hard geometric lines, for example. So they have different, they have, they have different suggestions. And there's also, there are, with forms, one of, the, one of the concepts that I'll mention later also is called visual weight. 
And the idea is when you look at something, and it doesn't matter whether it's two dimensions or not, is that what impact does that have you? What weight or impact does the seeing that have on you? And certain things have more visual weight than others. They, you notice them more. They have, they're more impactful. So that's, part, that's also related to the shape, is, is how much visual weight does that have? How much do, are you impacted by looking at it? Do you, do you barely notice it, or do you can't avoid not noticing it? And then along with that also is the idea of positive and negative spaces. A negative space in art is, is basically where there isn't anything. So for instance, if I look at a mug, the hole in the handle is a negative space. And so, and again, this, this doesn't matter whether it's two-dimensional or three-dimensional, negative spaces are important because you don't, you, the, and the balance between the negative space and the positive space is important. So for instance, if I have a mug with an enormous handle on it, it can look weird, partially because I've got this big open hole in the handle, and it dwarfs the size of the mug itself. So just the proportion of the hole in the handle to the body of the mug is important. And that's, that's, that's the proportion of the positive and negative space of looking at the piece. So the, 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 what the actual form or, and, and the terminology in, in three-dimensional, we call it a form, in two-dimensional, we call it a shape. Um, but the, but the, not just what the form is, but all the connotations of the form and, the thing, and what the form suggests are important. Because again, when you're creating a work of art, and, and ceramics is art, we don't have to go into that art versus craft thing. Well, I heard a great definition of that, is, and they said that craft becomes art when the person starts innovating. So that if you're adding your personality, if you're making changes and you're innovating and you're not just accepting, and this is true especially in, in, in you know, older cultures where th traditions are passed on, if you take it, something that's given to you and you change it a little bit or you modify it or you personalize it a little bit, then that's, that's, that, that's one of the definitions or one way to think of it is art. Because you're not just passing it along rotely, you modify it, you're thinking about it, you're making changes to it. And the changes might be related to you personally or to the time, the environment that you're living in, whatever, but you're modifying it. Okay, so that, that's form or shape. The second element of design is considered to be texture. And again, this can be 2D or 3D. So this, can, and the, the weird thing is this can be an actual texture, like on, in, in sculpture or in pottery, where you actually have a textured surface of some kind, you have raised lines or indentations, but it can also be suggested texture. You can suggest a texture just with patterns on the surface. So for instance, like polka dots even, polka dots on a surface make you almost think of either little bumps or little holes or something. You see that, not necessarily as a flat surface, especially depending on like if it's black on white or white on black. So it may, it may be a texture that your eyes suggest that it's there, but it's not really there, or it could actually be a texture, especially on ceramics where it could be carved or dented or sculpted or something like that. So texture is important. And the, other, and the, the feature about what texture does or can do for you is it activates the surface. It, 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 it makes the surface more interesting. It makes the surface come alive by having something going on on the surface instead of just being blank. So that's another element of the design. And another one of the classic elements of design is called line or lines. And it's literally that. It's are there lines somehow on the surface or on the edge of the piece? And lines, lines define, for one thing, lines define shapes and edges. So the outline of a piece is a line. So again, lines have certain characteristics. So for instance, a jagged line has different suggestions and different connotations than a smoothly curving line. It implies a different message. So the outline, if, instead of looking at the, not just the shape, but the outline, what, what line does the outline of the form trace tells you something. And the, the lines can suggest movement, for example, or they can suggest moods, like a, smooth, like a jagged line, like, like a, a lightning stroke versus lightning strike versus just a smoothly curving line can suggest very different moods. And, and again, you know, ex express or con part of what the pot is or the, the work of art is saying. Uh, is the line straight or curved? They have different connotations, different suggestive meanings. Is it thin versus wide? What's the quality of the line? Is it a solid, like let's say you're painting, you're painting on a pot, you're decorating a pot, and you create a solid band of color, or instead you do it like with a sumi brush, where you do like Japanese characters, where you get like a broken line and it's kind of patchy and streaky. The same width line, but if it's solid versus this sort of streaky and patchy and where you can see the individual brush marks has very different meaning or very different suggestions. 
So just with a line and the width and whether it's curved, there's a lot that, you, that you, you're saying with, 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 the, with the shape and the form of the line. And the fourth, the fourth element of design are marks. And this is, this is similar to texture, but these aren't necessarily, these don't have to be actual texture. These are just marks on a surface, like a design on a surface, for example. And again, they activate the, they activate the surface. They can activate the surface rather than just a blank space. And the last element is color, which is really important. The last element. These are the parts that you would, that you would use. You'd combine these parts to make a work. So, so you have color. So you have, and just some, again, some related definitions. The hue of a color is the actual color, red, yellow, blue, whatever it is. The, I'm gonna, I'll just, the terms are hue, value, saturation, and temperature. So the hue is considered the actual color. What is it? Red, green, what is it? The value is how light or dark it is. The saturation of a color is how pure or how dilute it is. So pink, for instance, is a, di is a diluted red. So pink is a less saturated red. It's been diluted, basically, like pastels. And finally, the temperature, is it a warm, is what we associate with a warm color or a cool color? Like reds and oranges and yellows are generally considered to be warm colors, and greens and blues are considered to be cool colors. So again, all of these, are projecting or translating into meaning in terms of when you look at them. We interpret them. And we generally, being human, we generally, we have a sort of a common civilization, a common background, so we generally interpret them in a similar way. But this isn't necessarily true for different cultures. Different cultures, you know, translate things in different ways. But at least these are the, these, this, this is all the language of color. There's a lot of language that you can use, just inherent in color. So those are the basic parts that you can think of. What it can, and again, I should mention also, if you look at, I've got a couple of references I'll give you later if you're interested in reading further about this. Not everybody agrees on what they are. If you look at different references, you may, somebody may, these are five. Somebody may have seven elements of design. Somebody may have four. Sometimes people put something in the principles that really is an element or the vice versa. So this, these aren't hard and fast. These are just, this is sort of a fairly common accepted definition, but it's by no means, you know, it's by no means the only one. As I say, and I've read other books where I go, wait a minute, this person has eight elements of design, you know, and so, okay, if that's the way they see it, that's fine. Okay, so those are the parts. So now how do we put them together? And so you use the, what are called the design principles to put these parts together. And the design principles are really rules for organization. How do you organize the parts? Or, or how can you analyze, when you look at the thing, how, are the, how can you analyze the way they were organized? And I have, let me see here, how many do I have here? I have, like, I have seven of them that we'll talk about briefly, because I don't want to, again, I don't want to overburden you with this. Because this, and, and part of this is when you read through, if you read books on this subject, you go like, well, how in the world do I use that? What do I do with it? And so what I've tried to do is translate some of that later on into questions that you can ask that use, that refer to these principles or refer to these things, but you're not saying, okay, I've got this rule. What do, you know, what do I do with it? Okay. Okay. So the first one, the first design principle is, is placement of the elements. The location, for one thing. So if I, and again, it doesn't matter two-dimensional or three-dimensional. So for instance, if I have a certain feature on a, on a work of art, where is it located? Is it at the center? Is it toward the edges? Is it, um, where is it? Where it is on, on the work of art? And again, all of these have, have connotations, for instance, if you have something in the, in the dead center, like a bullseye, that's generally interpreted to be a very static design. Because it's just, it, it doesn't invite your eye to move around. It's, it's very, it's very it's sort of dead. On the other hand, if you have a work of art where there's nothing in the center, that also is not necessarily good because you tend to see a hole. You see everything else arranged around and almost in, like you look at it and go, well, how come there isn't something in the middle? There, there ought to be something there. So, Part of it is, part of what we'll see with a lot of this is, is achieving a balance. You don't necessarily want only dead center, but you also don't necessarily want to completely avoid the center. So if I have, let's say I have a round form, let's say a vase form, like it looks like a little sphere, like a cannonball, I don't necessarily want to put a circle of slip or color right on the center and the side, because when I look at it, it doesn't, it doesn't move. Nothing, ha it just, you look at it and it's just dead. 
And I should mention that one of the, one of the, the features of really good art, and what, this is one of the sort of common accepted ideas, is that you want the viewer's eye to move around. You want the person, to make the work interesting, you want the viewer to explore the work. And so you want them to look at it, and, and if, you can see the, if you can analyze the whole thing and see the whole work of art with just a glance, then it's not very interesting. You look at it and you look away, okay, I've seen all there is to see. So you want to provide, you want to provide a way for the, the, the person to look at it and analyze it and, and coax their eye to move around and look at it. And if you just have one dot or something in the middle, that's it, they look at it and they're done. So part of this is also is tr trying to get the viewer to look at the work of art and look at one thing and then maybe notice something else and then maybe notice something else and, 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 look, and spend more time looking at it rather than just a quick glance where they, they can take it all in in one quick glance. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And consider becoming a patron of our channel. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. If you would like more information about our membership studio, classes, events, and multimedia productions at Washington Street Studios, visit our website at www.hfclay.com. The, so, for instance, as I say, so at the cent, we talk about the center and the edge. The center is 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 can be very static, um, but if you don't if you don't have anything in the center, it can, and and you obviously have stuff all around the edge, it looks a little weird, also because you sort of intuitively you say, well, I just there's a hole in the middle of this piece. Also, the now the and but now the other extreme is the edges. The edge of something can also be very powerful location, um, like. Like toward the edge, just whether, again, two dimensional, three dimensional, if it's toward the edge of something. And part of the edge's location, this is where culture comes in. In the Western civilizations, let's say, let's, 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 you know, if I'm looking at something, and let's say for now it is two dimensional, we, t we tend to look, the upper left is the most powerful location for edges because that's the way we read. And so we intuitively, when, if, you, if, I had a, if, I had, if I have a poster or anything, that I, or, just, or, or, or just a two-dimensional silhouette, you tend to look upper left, and things in the upper left are, are rated mentally more important because of the way we read in the Western cultures. Again, this would be different in other cultures, but because of the reading, upper left is considered a very powerful location. So upper, so upper, upper corners, upper left, lower right. Again, this is a cultural bias because of, of, of other associations in our culture. And so different locations on the edges or corners of things have different meanings for, in different cultures, different strengths. Along also as part of, so that's, that's the location as far as the placement. The other part of, lo, of placement is orientation. How are, the, how are these pieces or parts oriented? So for instance, if you end up with horizontal lines, if you, if, again, looking at something, and you have a lot of sort of horizontal lines or horizontal structures, that tends to suggest stability or groundedness or gravity. They look like, like static. They look like they're, they're, they're solid in place. And that's, that's not necessarily good or bad. That's just, that's just the way we, we tend as humans to interpret them. Whereas vertical lines and vertical forms tend to suggest more energy and growth because we think of plants, plants growing up, so ver tall forms, tall vase forms or whatever, we tend to think of more as energy or growth associated with them. And diagonal lines are even considered to be more energetic than vertical lines. Just again, this is just kind of the psychology of when you look at it, you tend to associate them um, as being even more energetic. So if you have a pot that's, that's low and wide, it tends to suggest stability and, and, maybe, and gravity and, and it not, no, not a movement. You have a vertical form and it tends to suggest upward movement, growth, and especially diagonal lines tend to suggest a lot of activity. They're probably the most energetic or what are diagonal lines. So just the placement, again, can say a lot of the, diff of the elements. The, the, the second design principle is the proportion of the parts. What if I have, if when I look at when I look at a painting or a, a piece of an artwork or a sculpture, and I can see different parts to it, like whether it's a figure with a head, torso, legs, or whether it's a whether it's a teapot with spout and a knob on the handle, is what are their proportions? Are they one to one? Are they two to one? Are they something uneven? And generally, even 
the, the lower ratios, like one to one, two to one, are considered very stable and because they're very familiar, but they're also boring, basically. So in general, for potters, we want to try to avoid things like one to one and one to two ratios, which means like if you have a pot, you don't want to put a line across the middle and divide it into two even parts. Or you don't want to divide it into a part where, where you know, again, with something, because it's, it's too familiar, there's nothing interesting about it. So you want to try to find uneven rate, uneven proportions of things that don't, when you look at it, you go, oh, that's, that cuts the piece in half. Okay, so uneven ratios tend to be more important. And there's one ratio, which you probably heard of called the golden ratio, which is equal to about 1.62, roughly. It goes on and on. It's one of those numbers that goes on and on forever, and you can't round it off. It just, you know, like it just keeps going in decimal points. And the golden ratio, and it's really interesting because this also is very common in nature. And this is one of those, and the reason why they call it, it's, it has a lot of different names, but it's called the golden ratio because for one thing, people tend, you tend to intuitively like it. They've done psychological tests where they've shown people, and you, you can think about it. I'll show you, like, I'll do a quick sketch of it. The, 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 this is a ratio of parts that occurs very frequently in nature. And so one of the theories is, and I don't know that they've ever proved it, but one of the theories is that we're so used to seeing it, at least we were in the past when we were more closely connected with nature, we saw it in plants, we saw it in trees, was that intuitively we liked it, we were comfortable with it. And, this, and they've done psychology tests where they've made rectangles. This is, this is divided into the golden ratio, and I'll explain it in a minute. But they've done tests in the past where they've presented um, people with just pictures of rectangles and, they, and with, a, with a line dividing them. And they just said, which one do you like the best? And invariably, they prefer the one with the golden ratio. They don't tell them anything about it, just say, which one sort of appeals to you the most? And they have different patterns, like different colors or whatever, but they're looking for the division. And invariably, people, people somehow are drawn toward the golden ratio. And the goal, what the golden ratio is, is that the, the ratio of sizes of the whole piece to this piece is the same as this piece is to that piece. That's the golden ratio. Yeah, the ratio, the proportion in sizes of this whole rectangle to this rectangle is, is the same as this rectangle is to that rectangle. And that proportion is about 1.62. And this shows up a lot, for instance, in plants, like at the spacing of the leaves on the plant. Um, and you, you've probably heard of the, there's a thing called the, 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 the logarithmic spiral. There's a spiral that occurs incredibly common in nature and it looks kind of like that. Occurs in, in shells in particular, occurs in the growth pattern of plants. Well, the golden ratio is involved with, with that spiral also. And so this is a very common feature in nature. The spacing of leaves, it, it, it's involved with, for instance, how the seeds are arranged in a sunflower head. That involves this, this spiral and the golden ratio. So the, the, for, throughout history, artists have been using this golden ratio in their work, in the, in the proportion of the parts, because it was because of this association that it's, it's something that people like. It, you're comfortable with it. You, you're drawn toward it. So in addition, this is, this is certainly an uneven ratio. But so part of, well, art, artists have used this traditionally a lot because it's a, it's a, they know it's, a, it's a, a ratio or proportion that people will like. You're drawn toward it. But just in general, it's a good idea that everything doesn't have to be the golden ratio, but it's a good idea to just avoid whole dimensions, you know, whole proportions. So if you, can do, if you break something in parts and you do it like in two-sevenths or four-ninths or something, but don't do it in halves. Thirds, and then people say, well, what about a third? Well, a third is better than a half, and, but quarters is too, if quarter, even, again, this is like even numbers, are too, they're too easy to spot. So you don't want to divide something in quarters. A third is not too bad, but avoid halves, avoid quarters. Um, and then when you get into higher proportions, then you don't, see, you don't see them as immediately, so they're okay. But again, it's just like, for instance, again, if I was making something, I would not want to put a line right around the middle. I, if I wanted to divide it, you know, I'd want to pick some point up here, maybe, or some point down here that, that when I looked at it, I had to study it for a minute because it wasn't an obvious half or an obvious quarter. It just makes it more interesting. Okay, so that's, so, purport, so you have the placement of the elements is the first one which is location and orientation. The second one is the proportion of the parts. The third one is the balance. And that, by that I mean the visual balance. And so part of what this includes is symmetry. What's the symmetry of a piece? For instance, when you look at it, is it, is it, 
is the left hand side a mirror image of the right hand side or is the top a mirror image of the bottom? That's, that's, this is twofold symmetry or mirror symmetry. Um, symmetry tends to be, if something is completely symmetrical, again, it tends to be very static. There's nothing good or bad about it. It's just, it, that's just, that's the connotation. Um, if it's asymmetrical, it tends to be more dynamic. And there are all different sort of subcategories that we won't go into here about asymmetry. But there are different ways of looking at something to see whether is it the same on both sides or is the top to bottom is the same or are they slightly different. Um, and there are, there are a lot of different variations on that where you can have it slightly asymmetric but still it looks balanced to the eye. So it, it doesn't have to be, it can be partially symmetrical and all different, it doesn't have to be completely asymmetric where it's totally random where nothing resembles anything but it can also be partially symmetrical. The fourth, the fourth um, principle is unity, and this is a really important one. Actually, there are two features here, what are called unity and variety. And unity means that when you look at the, the, the piece, when you look at the work of art, it, it all holds together. All the parts seem to be related in some way, and they all look like they belong. Variety is kind of the other extreme where you don't want it to be too uniform where it won't be very interesting. So really what you're looking for is a balance between unity, which makes it look ordered, it makes it look organized, and variety, which makes it look interesting. So if you have it look, if it's too, if it's, if you, if you use order to make it, to achieve unity, it can just be boring, nothing's happening. And if you have too much going on in the piece, too much variety, it can be just confusing, and there's no, and nothing, and it doesn't relate, although, you know, you've got so much, so many things happening that it doesn't seem to hold together. So you're, really looking, you're looking for some kind of a balance between that. You want to make it interesting. You want to make it look like the pieces come together, but, not, you know, but, not be, but still be interesting. And this includes things like you want the unity of the features. So for instance, on a teapot, you don't want a spout where the form of the spout is so wildly different than the form of the handle that they, don't, they look like they don't belong in the same pot, for example. You want them somehow, the curves of the spout and the curves of the handle somehow to relate to one another. They're different, obviously, because they're different pieces. But you still want them to, to you want your eye to see that they relate to one another. Um, and you also want, especially now that we're talking about three-dimensional forms, you want the surface to fit in or have unity with the, with the form as a whole. I don't want to have a form that seems to have a surface that doesn't seem to go with the, if I have a, a let's say if I have a form with, with beautiful sinuous curves, I don't necessarily want to have a whole lot of angular jagged decoration on the surface that seems to fight with this, what otherwise would be this beautiful sinuous curved form. So again, I want, I want, I want, I want there to be unity between the overall, the overall arrangement of the parts. And the unity, there are a number of things here that we can, I'm just going to list them briefly, but there are a number of, of things that we can, we can do to achieve unity. One is proportion. So I can have, I can have, I can have things, features that are roughly related to another in size in the same way, looking throughout the piece. So for instance, I wouldn't want to have an enormous spout on a teapot with a little tiny handle. Even if the curves match, there's something wrong with the proportion there. That's what they don't seem to fit. Um, you, you can do what's called grouping or repetition of, of the elements. This is the idea of this, the idea of this is, is a motif. And this is a very common thing in, in ceramics. It's what's called a motif. And it's a design idea that you repeat throughout the work. And so I might have, let's say I might, I might have a design where it, maybe I use a stamp on, let's say I'm making a platter or something like that. And maybe I have a large design in the center of the bottom somehow, of the bottom of the platter. Well then, and if I have handles on the tray of the platter, I might have a smaller version of that same design on the ends of the handles, or as a texture on the handles, so that when I look over the piece, this is where the unity comes in, I see that the same pattern is repeated in different sizes throughout, throughout the work. And, that's the, and that, so this is the idea of a motif. I've picked a design pattern or a design idea, and I'm repeating it throughout the piece, in different, and, 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 that, and that also ties the, the work together. Because when I look at the work, I see that same, rep that same idea scattered throughout the work, and it brings the work, to, relates the work together. Another, another way you can achieve this is by what's called pattern or rhythm and movement. And this involves, again, pattern is sort of similar to that, but like, do I have, do I have lines 
like, like, you know, if I take, for instance, like a serrated rib and I do wiggly lines on things, and I create a certain rhythm or, or waviness to the line, do I repeat that same waviness, that same repetition somewhere else on the piece? And maybe, maybe for instance, maybe I have, I, you know, I, I, I twist the rim of a piece and so I create a wave on the rim. Do I repeat that same, that same sort of wave maybe with a design on the bottom? <coughs> so that again, I can see, and that relates, I look at it and I see, oh, look at that, the, cur the, the waviness of the rim <coughs> is picked up with the waviness of the, of the the slip design, for example, on the bottom. And again, that, that, that ties the whole piece together. Um, the other thing that, another thing to talk about is contrast or emphasis. And by that I mean, are there, are there features of the work that, that contrast strongly with one another? Does something stand out or not? Or does everything, when you look at it, does nothing in particular stand out? And there are a couple of important points here. When you talk about emphasis, or, or con generally on, on any work of art, you want some kind of what's called a focal point. You want something that is sort of like a, a prominent feature that people are going to notice. You don't want to create something that looks like wallpaper. I mean, the, the classic idea of wallpaper is there's, there's nothing particular, you just see this endless pattern and there's no one point you tend to look at, which can be kind of boring. So the idea about what well, a work of art is like this, like we're talking about is, you want something, a strong feature or something that you want people to notice that relates to the purpose of the work. So maybe it is the spout on a teapot because the, the purpose of the teapot is, is serving or pouring. So maybe you want the person to notice that, that it's really strong, important, that this is, the minute they look at it, they say, this is a pouring vessel because of the, this unique feature of the, the pouring spout. So you do want a focal point but you also don't want to be, that to be the only thing they notice. So there's a, there's a, a concept called, you want a, what's called a hierarchy of emphasis. And by that means, you have maybe one important point that people to look at, and then you have a couple of others that are not quite as dominant, but they're still focal points. They're sort of like second order focal points that people will notice those next. And then they'll note, and you may even have a third level where people notice those next. And again, what this does is this invites the, the eye to look around, to find things. You want the, you want the, 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 the observer to, to explore the work and not just, again, not just look at it and go, yeah, I've seen it. So if you have, they, they might notice, let's say on this teapot example, they might notice the spout and then they notice, oh, well look, the thumb rest on the handle is a miniature version of the spout. So that's another sort of little focal point. It's not as strong as the spout is, but it, it relates to it. And it's, it's still something that it stands out, they notice it. And then you might notice that, you know, look, the curve on the feet also picks up the same curve that I've got on the spout. They're smaller, so I've got this large spout, I've got a, I've got a thumb rest or a curve in the back of the handle, and smaller feet that all relate to one another. So your eye goes spout, handle, feet. And by that, you've, gotten, you've, you've, you've made the eye move around on the piece. And again, it makes the work more interesting. But it also ties them together because the form of all these parts is related. Okay, and the, so the fifth, that's, that's unity and variety, which we're trying to get a balance of on the piece. Um, the, ne the next one is complexity. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this a whole lot, but the point is, there's a point where less is more. Or the old expression, gilding the lily. You can have too much on a piece. Uh, I knew, a, I knew a, a guy that I knew used to make pots and he made little, little teacups and bowls and he did every possible design technique you can do on each bowl and it was just way too much. I mean, he had slip decoration, he had, he had neriyagi, he had carved rims, he had different overlapping glazes and you looked at it and the, part of it was you didn't know what to look at first and nothing stood out. Now, if they had been sort of a hierarchy, it might have been better, but everything was kind of like equal importance. And so you didn't know, you, there was nothing, you know, so you looked at it and it was almost like, I don't even want to bother to look at it because there was nothing, it was almost like too much work to look at it and nothing, you couldn't focus on anything. So there's such a thing for complexity is yes, you want it to be interesting, but it can be too complex. There can be too much going on. Um, another one, that the, the sixth, the sixth principle is I'm calling scale and context. And by context, I mean with the surroundings. And this is this probably, there, there are two ways that I, I think this applies to. Um, scale, I think, applies maybe more to sculpture. And that, what that means is scale relation to the setting for the work of art. What is, where, wherever this, whatever this piece is going to be seen, how does it relate to its environment? And therefore, is it an appropriate scale? 
It can also relate to, you know, I mean, uh, pieces where, for instance, there's a message like a political statement or something. But in other words, if you're trying to say something with a work, it can be, for example, too small and it, and it sort of doesn't have the impact. Let's say, you, let's say you make, like Robert Arneson, I don't know if you're familiar with any of his work, and he did a lot of sort of political commentary. And so if he was doing a political commentary, let's say on the Vietnam War, and he does something this big, it's not gonna have much impact. So the scale, in that case, it could be exactly the same, but the scale of the work was important to convey what he wanted to convey. It had to be big enough to make an impact on you, okay? The other thing is when I say context is that um, I saw a good example of this where um, there was an artist that was making dinnerware, and the whole idea was to relate the dinnerware to, and she was making dinnerware or planning to make dinnerware for customers, like custom dinnerware. And it was a good idea that she wanted to relate the design of the dinnerware to the setting in which the customer was going to use it. So she was taking architectural features from their house and their dining room and their, and their, and their taste and their furniture and building it into the dinnerware so that it wasn't, it wasn't copying it by any means, but you could see it was a consistent style. So that when they were serving, and this was meant to be like fairly formal, you know, nice dinnerware, when they were serving at, at a table, it related to the surroundings. That isn't necessarily always true, but in that case, the dinnerware was a really nice example. It was a nice example of that. And so, so it's something to think about. So th and this was, this was commission work. So she would, she'd go into the people's houses, um, take photographs of the house, look at their, their sort of sense of style, their sense of design, and then try to include certain, and even color schemes, if they, you know, that maybe they had bright colors, and maybe they like subdued colors or earth tones, and work that into the, so that the, the, the dinnerware could stand on its own, but it also related to their house and, their, and, their, and where they were going to be using it. And a good, an, an, another example of that might be, for example, um, in the Japanese tea ceremony or in Japanese, in Japanese surroundings, a lot of times a single vase of flowers will be displayed as part of the Japanese tea ceremony or in, Jap or in Japanese homes. And so it's important that the style of the vase, for example, is consistent with, with its surroundings. So that it isn't just, it looks like it belongs there, in other words. It re somehow relates to the surroundings. And the last, the last one I have here for the principle is the meaning or the purpose of the work. And so the real point here is that, depending on what it is, the parts and, must relate to the function. If it's a functional, whatever the, whatever the meaning is, all the parts must, must relate to it. So that if it's, a, if it's a teapot, you don't want to have a handle that looks like it's, or that it looks or is uncomfortable to pick up. So the, so the point is that regardless of what the, uh, the, the purpose of the work is, and it could be, they call it like narrative. In other words, are you trying to just sort of like tell a story or suggest a story? Is it a strictly functional piece? Um, is, it, is it a political commentary? Whatever, is it just an emotional piece? Um, is it just something where you're just trying to get somebody to look at and say, you know, that, that just is pure beauty. Um, but you need, but all the parts and the work as a whole also have to all contribute to that. You don't, especially you don't want something that sort of fights with it. You don't want a feature that seems to contradict whatever the purpose is because then the viewer is going to get confused and the message won't be clear. We know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time. So if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. Well, we really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts. And if you'd like to help us, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. We have five options, five different patronage levels that you could subscribe to. And we decided instead of naming them the typical gold, silver, bronze, platinum, we decided to give them clay names. So the first, the first level we have is, is what we're calling a clay patron, and that's for a dollar a month. And in, in exchange, you get recognition on our patron appreciation page in, our, in all of our videos. The second level that we have, we're calling a BISC level, which is um, $5 a month. And again, you get the recognition, plus you get a Potter's Roundtable sticker that you can put on your laptop or wherever you like, or on your forehead. Um, looks like this. Um, the third level that we have is called the Earthenware level. That's $10 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get a transcript of any available episode that we have every month, a transcript of the, of the, of the presentations. The, the stoneware level is the next one. That's for $20 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get one of our Potter's Roundtable t-shirts that looks like this. And the final level that we have is what we're calling the porcelain patron level, which is for $50 a month. 
And again, you get all the previous benefits. And you also get a handmade by our by Dennis, our, our one of our founding members here, a handmade uh, pot, Potter's Round Table mug. The Potter's Round Table is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.